Hello and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast and we're going to have a great show today. Uh, we're going to talk multifamily, um, investing, how to be a passive investor, steps to learning about investing in, in multifamily and self-storage and all that good stuff and how uh, maybe somebody that's a uh, W-2 employee might start getting their feet wet into real estate investing and, and that's what a lot of people do and um, our guest today Eileen Pratt. Uh, she's with bon, uh, bon, Bonavest Capital, which means good investing, essentially. Mm -hmm. All right, learn that. Uh, she, she lives with her husband and, and children in Southern California. She's a, a W-2 employee, working full-time, raising children and also a very active real estate investor. So welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me, Bo. And I forgot to mention, because I, uh, when I started listening to your podcast, I, re I, I realized it was really good. And I need to subscribe to it. The podcast is called, How Did They Do It? Real Estate Podcast. And that's really cool because that's what every, everybody wants to know. How did these people do it, right? What were the steps they took in order to get started in real estate investing? So why don't you walk us back to your first uh, investment and, and most investors start in the single family home space. It sounds like that's where you started. Mm -hmm. And then what made you realize that maybe multifamily would be a better option for you? Yeah. So I started back, you know, a couple of years ago, investing in single family homes. And what we did was we invested out, I live in California. So I invested outside of California because it was much more affordable out there. You're able to cash flow a lot better than you would ever get anything in California. So that's what we did, me and my husband. We looked for single families outside because that's all we knew is single families. And then we got, our, we got a couple of single families, but then before we got too deep into it, we realized, and we did the calculations, how many single families do I need to get into and how much cash flow do I need to be producing from those um, single family homes to be able to reach a financial number that we would consider ourselves as financial independent. And when we did that, we're like, oh, well, we do need a, we need to acquire quite a number of doors to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, there was some hurdles and stuff like that, that you would have to face once you reached a certain limit number of doors from single families in terms of lending and everything. So we were trying to figure out all these strategies to be able to reach that financial freedom number. And as we were doing that, we were networking with other people in real estate. And that's when we came across multifamily syndications. That was back in the end of 2019 when we started uh, learning about multifamily syndications and this model that we had never heard of before that, um, you know, it was very interesting because from what we had learned and from what we had had uh, heard from other people talking about, it was very scalable. It fit our model, what we were looking to achieve. The scalability was there. And then it was really just educating ourselves, learning about it, deep diving into podcasts, reading books, and then started networking. And then that's where our, you know, our real estate journey really took off from there. Yeah, that's, that's a great story. And I'm doing the same thing too. I was just telling you before we went live, it's like, okay, here's a duplex, but how many of these duplexes do I need to get to the financial independence number? And it's, it's significant. And uh, it, it, at the same, that's why I see my friends that are in the multifamily business or the syndication business where they can, you know, quickly learn how to partner, right? And then in, 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 in a sense, they can really supercharge their, the cash flow because they're partnering, they're buying larger deals. It's almost less headache because you don't need to own 50 rental properties. You can have two or three or four buildings uh, in different locations. So as you were getting into this multifamily journey, and I think you said you had you had first invested passively, and we mm -hmm. oftentimes you hear people talk about a GP and an LP. Can you kind of explain to the audience that might not understand what a GP and an LP are? And and like I I'm thinking that you invested as an LP because you wanted to learn and you also probably like the deal, but can you kind of walk us through that whole uh, idea in your mind and how you just built a framework like, okay, let's learn the process really well. And let's, let's find a, um, a sponsor that's good. And, and how did that process look for you? 
Yeah. So um, the difference between the general partners versus the limited partners is just really the active versus the passive partners. So on the general partner side, you're doing the active work, you're doing the due diligence, acquiring the loans, um, looking at the properties, um, also working on obtaining capital to be able to close on that. So it's, and you're also doing the maintenance day-to-day -day activities, everything that's involved into the landlord activities. You might have some property management companies to help you with it too, but you're overseeing all of that. As a limited pass a limited partner, all you're really doing is providing the capital to invest alongside the general partners. So you're still a part owner of it. You're still able to participate in it. However, you're, you don't have any landlord activities. You don't have to get to the day-to-day -day activities of um, doing landlord activities, acquiring or anything like that, but you're able to just invest passively and then return, receive the returns afterwards. So really mailbox money. So as a passive investor, most of your work is going to be upfront due diligence on the sponsor on the deal itself. And so for us, what we liked about it was we were able to take our money because we were W-2 workers. We were able to take the money that we had, you know, saved in our banks because that's what we were taught is save, save, save. And then instead take that money and allocate it to a passive investment um, first in the syndications. And that was really fantastic because it allowed us to have our money working for us in that aspect while we were able to focus on other things. So our money is working for us instead of us having to work for it. And so that's kind of how we thought about it. And that's how we decided to get involved as a passive investor first, and then really vet the sponsors that we were in, because I, like you mentioned, it was the best way for us to learn was to partner with experienced people in the space that we really knew, liked, and trust. And so, um, you know, I know there's certain skill sets you need in, in multifamily. Um, you need somebody that can really dive deep into spreadsheets and so forth. Um, what, what in the active roles you play with your, your, as a general partner in some of these transactions, where are your skill sets best suited? Are you out there uh, raising capital or are you more like you like to get the pro formas built? You're a numbers person. What do you, what's the day-to-day -day look like for you as far as the real estate space? So the fantastic thing about this is that my husband and I, we do this together. So we're able to divide and conquer our roles um, and, and really touch all aspects of it. So we together like to, you know, do the underwriting, look at the numbers, also talk to investors and then bring in the capital as well. So really upfront, be part of the entire due diligence process, really understanding where the numbers are coming from. And then also, you know, providing opportunities to our network and our investors as well to be part of those opportunities. Yeah, that, that's really good. And, and then obviously, if you listen to our podcast, uh, you know, you're going to learn that there's potentially some really good tax benefits. When I started learning more about the, the syndication space, you really started to learn about like you're going to people are you're going to start hearing the word cost segregation, accelerated depreciation, bonus depreciation. I mean, over the last couple of years, you know, even early on in my career, I knew nothing about, I knew you could depreciate properties over if it's residential over 27 and a half years, but there's a, so many great things about these larger properties. Now you can also potentially cost segregate single family homes if they're rental properties and so forth, but, but you, you're starting to like learn these tools. And that's why you see a lot of these very successful real estate investors and everybody complains that they pay no taxes is because they're using these um, strategies. And, and I, and so as you get more involved in the space, because there's a whole world over here that's like W-2 and they just don't understand that even though you're W-2, you might be able to offset some of your earned income potentially, you know, talk to your CPA. And I mean, that's just another huge, huge strategy. So um, how, what's the best way that you find that obviously you have your podcast and people get interested because everybody's interested in real estate. They see the TV shows, they want to do real estate, right? But but really, um, how do you how do you help educate your people that come to you and like they want to invest? And they, you got to kind of go through the whole process, right? Here's a GP, here's LP. This is how where you start if you want to start. Usually, you usually start as an LP, and then you can just start educating them on cost segregation and things like that. And is that kind of why you guys uh, started your podcast? Is just hey, we're going to interview other people how they did it, and that's why you call it how they how did they do it real estate podcast, right? So. When did you guys start the podcast and um, 
do a lot of people listen now and reach out to you because they're like, Hey, we want to do this. And you guys are normal people and, you know, hardworking people and you guys did it. Now we want to do it. And then you ed start educating them on the process of like what, how we analyze deals and so forth. Yeah. So it all goes back to when we took a look at it, we, before we started this journey, it's like, well, why do we want to get into this? What kind of life are we trying to design for ourselves? What kind of life can we see for ourselves, for our families? And how can we get there? And what are the steps that we can do to, in order to do it? And so for us, the fundamentalist things that we learned was get your education, try to learn and gain as much knowledge as you can from the smartest of the smartest, the brightest of the brightest, you know, like you never want to be in a room where you're the smartest person. You always want to be in a room where you can always absorb and learn and then try to gain as much value as possible from other people. And so that's really why the podcast started was because our journey started off by listening to podcasts and we gained so much value from it. And we were asking people a lot of questions on how they were able to do the things that they were doing, how they got, how they got to where they are. And so it just was a natural fit for us that we wanted to share with other people also. And at the same time, you know, be able to invite guests onto the platform as well that, you know, we might not have had the opportunity to otherwise. So it's really trying to educate and to, to learn from the people that we are bringing on. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's really smart. And I do the same thing. <laughs> and it's like, it's, you get value because I can literally just sit here and ask you questions and like, okay, how did they do it? Right. Like it, <laughs> and it's, it's like a perfect, perfect um, platform to do it. Um, so I know you own some assets in Las Vegas, you own assets in Tampa and Colorado and Mississippi. Uh, I see, I see that it looks like you've done one really large self storage deal. Was that, was that a deal that, um, another sponsor, uh, had tied up and you then took a look at it and they, and then you came as a, in, as a co-partner on that deal? Yeah. So with the self-storage, we're always looking for good opportunities. We always like the self-storage space because it is a stabilized asset class. So we like to diversify a little bit. And so with that one there, it was structured as a joint venture. And so the opportunity came through one of our networks that we had known for a little while. And you know, my husband, he had flown out there, did the due diligence, due diligence on it with them and took a look at it and really evaluate whether or not it really fit our portfolio and whether or not we believed in the opportunity, if we believed in um, the performance of it. And so it ended up, you know, it fit our portfolio. It, we liked what we saw. It was very undervalued. It was bought at a very good price in our opinion. And so, um, yeah, we jumped on the chance to be able to partner with them on this joint venture and then really just learn from them as, as well, um, in the self-storage space. Yeah. So I hear a common message is that, that, you know, you, you're always learning, right. And you're always, mm -hmm. you're fine. Multifamily and the bigger commercial, pro um, properties, these deals are more of a team sport as opposed to me. Like when I just told you, I just bought a duplex. That's not a team sport. Usually it's just one person in the bank or the, the private debt fund that makes the loan. When you were getting started, who was the most influence, uh, influential person, uh, as far as like, if you want to call it a mentor or somebody you would listen to and say, this is the person that's teaching us the most about multifamily. So the most about multifamily, I think it would have, if it, so I would say it in two steps because I think they really go hand in hand together. So on the multifamily side, you know, we listen to like Joe Fairless. He has a really great podcast, um, his books, and he was just a fantastic person um, overall in general. And so we really looked up to him as a person and what he has been able to bring to this space. And then the second person was um, coach Trevor McGregor. And he really focuses on the mindset and allowing us to think bigger and the possibilities out there because getting started, especially in the multifamily space, you always, you know, you, you didn't think this type of things were possible before getting into it. And so getting over those limiting beliefs and opening our eyes to possibilities out there, and then just opening up our, um, I guess our potential, that was a huge game changer for us, changing our mindset to be able to do these types of things, partner with other people, you know, really focus on the team sport atmosphere and then not really just going in alone. Those two people I would say had really kickstarted, um, and has been so influential. And was that a coach, one of Joe's coaches, Joe Fairless coach, coaches, was your personal coach or something? Yes. Co coach, what was his name? Trevor McGregor. Trevor McGregor. Okay. Yeah. So, so and, he, and he's really good at the mindset stuff because mm -hmm. everybody, 
it's a common common um, theme too is that a lot of it is all mindset because I think a lot of us are intimidated by these big numbers. Um, but you're you're a numbers person yourself, right? So like I think probably the 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 data portion of analyzing multifamily families isn't overwhelming to you. I would probably guess it's it's probably more of just like you know partnering with other people and taking risk, right? And like you, you're if you're if you're bringing in investors into a deal, you know, like the first thing about that is protect your investors' capital, right? Like mm -hmm. that there's a certain fear level, um, and and a lot of us too were probably brought up in a way that kind of like oh like we, what you were saying earlier is that oh i need to save right like and if you say in in this generation if you save money in the bank what's going to happen you end up losing money right <laughs> it's so how do you so 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 really you overcame the you had good coaching early on mm -hmm. you dove in a podcast you listened and just walk me through like your first deal was it like your first deal which was like a either a jv or a syndication was it one of those deals that was like 20 or 30 units how'd you how'd you i guess cut your teeth on your first bigger deal yeah so our first deal was a uh, 20 unit apartment it was in the las vegas market and we had partnered with a co-sponsor who was our boots on the ground in that area who had a lot of experience already in the space and so they were already in the market they knew it and so we always came from a place of wanting to learn and try to add value where we could and so we were able to partner with them on this syndicated deal um, to bring in some capital to learn from them to really mentor from from what they have done and what they have learned throughout their many years of, of experience as well and so that's really how we got first started was um, through that first 20 unit deal and then it has you know, they always say it's the hardest one is that first deal. And after that, things just started to snowball and started to rolling along. And um, that's where we get to today. Oh, that's great. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. Connected. And now, um, I mean, the mar market's even more tight than ever right now, right? And we, we're, there's a war, there's mm -hmm. huge inflation, there's, we're just getting, I mean, we're not over COVID, people are still getting COVID, but it's slowing down, thank, thank the Lord. Um, but what, what's your thought process right now? Like, I, I mean, most of the people I know are still pretty bullish on real estate and, and as there's limited inventory, Deals are compressed. I mean, what markets are you intrigued on right now? I mean, are you are you really just how many deals do you do you really you need to look at a lot of deals, I'm guessing. But like, I just want to hear uh, kind of markets you're interested in. Are you looking for more self storage? Are you open to that? Are you open to multifamily? Any other asset classes at this time or, or, or what's the kind of focus for the next 12 or 24 months? Yes, we're still bullish on multifamily market. Um, you know, self storage we're always open to opportunities, but it hasn't been our like full on for focus. Uh, if you're trying to catch too many fish at once, you might not catch any at all. So our focus is just multifamily. And if a good opportunity that we cannot pass up in self storage or something else comes around, then we'll like take a look at it and consider it. Um, but with multifamily, we think you know the the. The hard thing right now, like you mentioned, is that there's a lot of cap rate compressions. People are buying up a lot of these properties, but at the same time, it's really doing your due diligence up front, putting those correct, uh, those conservative levers in there in terms of reserves, making sure you're not being overly aggressive. And we're not looking to ever be like the, you know, the fastest growing company or like the biggest company. So we're okay with taking our time, making sure we're doing our proper due diligence, looking at the numbers. And does it really make sense at the end of the day? Because you never want to get into a deal where you are overly bullish on it and then it doesn't turn out as the way you expect it to be. So if you do your proper due diligence up front, then um, you know, it might take some more time to get a deal in this, in this environment. 
but you know, they say slow and steady, right? Slow and steady. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, it's true. And, and, and sometimes I see people and they like, they do the, like they have one deal going, they haven't even closed it. And they're like, got like 20 deals in their pipeline. I'm like, well, that slow down, slow down, you know, and, and granted it works out for some people, but personally, I'm like, I I've, I've learned from past experiences myself, like where I was flipping and I got too many at one time and what happens you break down, right? Like it just, there's too many moving parts and you got to build systems to do, to get that big. And, and so I think yeah. it's, lear it's learning and, and there's no rush, right? Like you just mm -hmm. move the needle each day. Yeah. Like um, I'll give an example too. like my husband and I, we underwrote, like actually underwrote 300 deals and we, you know, place offers. And then it ended up getting one offer accepted. <laughs> but after we did the due diligence on it, the numbers didn't pass, pan out anymore as we walked the property and toured it. And then, so we ended up having to walk away from that. But that kind of gives you into perspective. Some people are like um, one to 200, but in this market now, it's a lot harder to find a good deal or a deal that pencils out from the beginning. Did you ever, did you get any pushback from family at all when you, when you started getting into investing in real estate or, or were they supportive? It was tread cautiously into it, right? It's like, make sure you understand what you're getting into it because this is a space that, you know, most people are familiar with the single family type of space. And this, this environment that we're in, the syndicated space is brand new to a lot of people. And so they, I think they're just like kind of watching on the sidelines, seeing what we're doing and then how we are, like, what are we doing in this space and everything like that. So they're keeping a pulse on us. Um, but they, I, I think because of our personalities and how we approach things typically, they, they look at us and they're like, okay, we're not, like risk takers or <laughs> really not. And so if we get into something, it's because we've done our due diligence on it. We've looked at it and we really understand it before we move into something. Um, because we're, we're, I guess we were, we, we look at things that from a conservative standpoint and try to, you know, do our best to make sure that we have proper, um, reserves, proper things in place to hedge against anything that would go wrong. But of course, you know, their investments, right. Anything could go wrong, but you try to do your best to mitigate those risks as much as possible. Yeah, that you're exactly right. And, and I have like, right now I have a lot of investors that I'm working with financing and they're buying short-term rentals and like that market is just booming right now. And, and could it be because COVID is like, you know, 10 xing that space, right? Everybody just wants to buy cabins in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. And, and the cabins that used to sell for 400,000 are selling for a million bucks right now. And so I just tell people, listen, you got to stress test everything. Just like, mm -hmm. because I mean, really, you, you'll never, if you don't need to, if you don't get forced to sell, you'll never really get injured too badly it's really the people that are doing heavy what i think might happen or, or you might see unfold is and it's just kind of people that are doing heavy value add deals that aren't mitigating risks the right way and thinking that you know they're going to have a, a takeout and then construction costs right uh, labor shortages those are the things that like a pro proactive general partner would be making sure they're doing the due diligence up front. Like, okay, like, you know, we're going to get detailed line item budgets for all these bids, mm -hmm. but then there's unforeseen things like labor shortage and so forth. So you always have to have that contingency in there on anything you do. I mean, I flipped so many houses where I thought it was going to be a $60,000 remodel and it was like 130,000 because I wasn't doing the homework. Right. And mm -hmm. that was before we had any of these labor issues. So, you know, that's, that's, that's a space where I see people, you know, miscalculating and, and it's a very, it's, it seems like it's easy, but for whatever reason, working with the, in the construction space is the most challenging part. I find like just getting things done. And it's like the one variable that's out of your control scheduling and get getting that, that stuff. But um, the nice thing about the multifamily space is that you have all these other doors that are cash flowing. Right. And then, right. so those eight units that are being remodeled really aren't that painful versus if you're doing one flip, what are, um, what would you say if somebody's out there right now and, and, um, you know, they're, they're probably one of those people that just listens to these podcasts, like for year, day in and day out, how long did it, how, you know, how long did it take you to take action? Uh, and granted everybody's different, but you know, what, what, where was that breaking point where you're like, okay, I've done enough of this. Let's actually go out and take action. How long did it take from the, the time you started studying multifamily to you, the, the time you like got your got your first property under a uh, under contract so the time when we started was and the time we got into our first limited partner passive investing deal i would say was about three to four months of 
this was hardcore listening to podcasts, reading any books that we can get our hands on. Um, you know, we have long commutes both to and for from work. So we were listening to it all the time on our lunch hours, consuming as much content as we could. And there comes to a point where you, you learn as much as you can but you can't learn anymore until you actually take that action because you don't know what you don't know. And so you, you have to just learn up as up until as much as you can. And then, and then really just taking that leap of faith, leap of faith, and then really just doing your due diligence on who you're investing with. And so I think that kind of, it really depends on person to person, but there's a certain point where it's like, okay, I've learned up until this amount. And then let's take that action because I can never get to that next step unless I take that action, that next, that next action. Um, if I just listen to podcasts, I'm never really in the game until I actually, you know, jump in. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Very good. And what do you, what do you do on a daily um, basis? Um, do you have any kind of rituals or morning routines that you stick with? Are you pretty disciplined, like to keep you like motivated, right? Cause you can easily just say, Oh, I'm, I got my W-2 job. I don't need to go look at deals today. I mean, what keeps you motivated? For me, it's definitely the podcast, whether or not I'm interviewing a guest myself, I'm always also listening to podcasts, trying to consume content because I get so much inspiration from other people and what they're doing in this space and how they've been able to do it. There's so many smart and intelligent people and such, they are so inspiring. And so by listening to those types of podcasts, I'm really elevating myself, really increasing my education base and really getting motivated by those types of people. Awesome. I love it. And what's the best place for people to find out uh, about more about you? Is that go to your website? Yeah, so they can go to our website. We have a video course that they can go ahead and just download. Um, it's free. It's just at bonavistcapital.com. Just drop in your email address and then we'll send you the course or they can just send me an email directly. It's Eileen at bonavistcapital.com. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure talking with you today and getting some insight from you. And um, at some point, I hope I get invited on your show. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk. I'll, I'll, I'll educate and make everybody laugh. I'm talk about real estate financing. Anyways, thanks everybody for tuning in. Please like and subscribe to this channel. I'll put the, I'll put uh, the link to your website below so people can check check you out and and learn what you're doing a little bit more. And you can download her 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 uh, her little mini video course. And and I would definitely suggest checking out our podcast because I think they have well over 350 episodes at this point. So, um, and they, you have a lot of, lot of good reviews too. I was like checking out the reviews. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Yeah. So anyways, thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you on the next episode.